Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please replace the like button's melatonin with Radathor. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. By the beginning of 2016, everybody who lived in apartment building number 12 on Shanxi Road in the big Chinese city of Xi'an knew to stay away from the woman who lived at the end of the hall on the 15th floor. Now, they didn't know much about this woman, but what they did know about her was totally bizarre and kind of alarming. The woman, whose family name was Wu, but nobody actually knew this woman's individual name, was 43 years old and she lived alone. And from what residents could tell, nobody ever came to visit her and she almost never left her apartment. But oftentimes residents on the 15th floor could hear this woman talking to herself very animatedly inside of her apartment and sometimes she'd even get into these big arguments with herself where it was clear she was kind of playing the role of multiple personalities at once. But none of these things were the reason why people avoided her altogether. They avoided her because she seemed really dangerous. One day, a few months earlier, a teenage girl was walking down the hallway on the 15th floor, making her way towards her friend's apartment, when she passed by this woman's apartment door. And as soon as she walked past, the door to this woman's apartment flew open, and the woman rushed outside and began screaming incoherently. And so this teenage girl, she whips around and sees this woman, and instinctively, what this girl thought was, oh my goodness, this woman is being attacked, you know, she's running away from somebody in her apartment or something, but then very quickly it became apparent that this woman was not being attacked. She was attacking the teenage girl. So this woman, she looks at the girl and her eyes go wide and she kind of curls her hands into claws and then she began running down the hall towards this girl. And so the girl, she begins to scream and she turns and she runs down the hall and she manages to pound on her friend's door and her friend happened to be right behind the door. They opened it up, the girl ran inside and they shut and locked the door right as this woman came barreling into the door. And this behavior from this woman on the 15th floor was just the beginning. Following this first attack, the woman on the 15th floor would routinely barge out of her apartment and chase down young women and teenage girls that were walking past her door. Now, this woman never actually hurt anyone that she chased down and even reached in time. She just kind of scared them. And so as a result, the residents of this apartment building, including the women and young girls who had been attacked by this woman, their reaction to this was not anger or resentment or, you know, some desire to go call the police and have this woman arrested. Instead, the residents of this building just kind of felt bad for this woman. It seemed very obvious that she was mentally unwell and probably very lonely. And so they kind of collectively decided to not call the police and instead just kind of ignore her. But sometime in early February, this woman's random attacks on young women and girls just kind of stopped. And at first, residents, especially of the 15th floor of this apartment building, were just relieved because all of a sudden, you could walk down that hallway in peace again. But by the end of February, it dawned on people who lived in this apartment building that not only had this woman stopped her random attacks, but also now they couldn't even hear her inside of her apartment talking to herself because that was something people always heard. And now her apartment was totally silent. And so pretty quickly, people became kind of worried about this woman. But nobody was willing to go knock on her door and actually make sure she was okay because, again, this woman was viewed as being kind of dangerous. I mean, she was literally jumping out of her apartment and attacking random passerbys. And so people just continued to keep their distance from this woman. And so as people did that, they began to tell themselves that, you know, probably she just moved out without anybody noticing, and that's why she's gone quiet. But it would turn out that was not the case. Right around the time the woman on the 15th floor stopped her attacks and went silent sometime in early February, an elevator inside of this apartment building broke down between floors 11 and 10. 
And so a maintenance crew was called out to fix the elevator, but when they got there, they realized they didn't have the supplies or the manpower to actually make the fix, and so a decision was made to just cut the power to this individual elevator car, and then the work crew said they'd come back in about a month when they had the right supplies and people. And sure enough, a month later, this crew came back with what they needed, and they were able to lower the broken elevator car down to floor 10, and then they opened up the doors, and they were absolutely horrified at what they saw inside of that car. It's believed that shortly after this woman on the 15th floor had one of her outbreaks and chased someone down the hall, she got into the elevator and began traveling down. And when the elevator car got between floors 11 and 10, it came to a lurching stop. But for some reason, when this happened, the woman did nothing. She didn't yell for help, she didn't scream, she didn't pound on the doors, she didn't press any buttons. She just sat in the elevator car in absolute silence. And so eventually it was discovered that one of the elevator cars in this apartment building was broken, not because the woman had called out, but probably because someone had tried to hail the elevator and it didn't come down. And so that maintenance crew was called out, but they couldn't make the repair, and so they decided to cut the power to that car and come back in a month. Now, this elevator crew had no idea there was anybody inside the elevator car, because again, this woman who was trapped in there was totally silent throughout their attempts to try to fix the car. And so after these workers cut the power to this elevator car and left, this woman was doomed. This woman just sat in silence in this elevator car with no food and no water for several days until she died of dehydration, which is one of the most agonizing and slow ways to go. Now, at some point, this woman did attempt to free herself because there were scratch marks inside the elevator indicating that she had tried to claw her way out and her hands were totally mutilated, suggesting she really had been clawing pretty hard. But that was the only time she tried to save herself. Otherwise, she just sat there and eventually died. Last winter, me and old Sega Wong decided to go on a surfing trip. And so naturally, we flew to Colorado and hiked to the very top of the tallest mountain we could possibly find. But unbelievably, there were no beaches up there. And so Wong and I didn't even get to go surfing. <laughs> But our failed surfing trip did have a silver lining. At the top of that Colorado mountain was a cave. And in that cave, deep within the mountain, was a walrus. And if you know anything about me and old Sigalum, as we love giving those god walrus a good touch and every chance we get. And so we took that opportunity and really laid into that stupid walrus for about 36 hours. But at the 36 hour mark, the walrus had had enough. And we got up on its flip and we began chasing us through the cave. And so me and Long turned and we began running, running for our lives. And as we ran, we did the only thing we knew how to do. We signed up for DraftKings. Now, did that save us from the walrus? No! But did it get us jacked up in our football season? Yes, it did. So jacked up, in fact, that this year we're partnering up with DraftKings to make sure all you strange, dark, and mysterious aficionados out there are kept up to date about the very best deals on the DraftKings platform. Like DraftKings Very Awesome No Sweat Same Game Parlay, where if your bet loses, you get a bonus bet back in the amount of your original bet. Pretty good. There's also loads of other amazing opportunities on DraftKings, so go check it out. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code MrBallin, bet $5, and get $200 in bonus bets immediately. That's promo code MrBallin only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Around 5.20 p.m. on August 31st, 2007, a young couple stepped onto the beautiful sand of Yelpo Beach, which is located at the very southern tip of South Korea. The couple grabbed each other's hands and smiled in excitement as they looked out on the water and saw all these fishing boats that dotted the horizon, and then behind them were all these beautiful mountains. I mean, this was a spectacular place. They couldn't believe that a place so gorgeous and so remote was located only a one-hour train ride away from the busy city where they went to college. The couple's names were Kim and Chu. Kim was 21 years old, and he was an athlete and a very dedicated student. And 
Kim Chu, she was 20 years old and also very studious, but maybe unlike Kim, she was a bit more reserved and shy. In fact, Kim was Chu's very first serious boyfriend, and she absolutely adored him. And in fact, this was going to be the couple's kind of big first trip that they would take together. It was a Friday, and Kim and Chu planned to spend the entire weekend exploring this place called Yelpo Beach. Yelpo Beach is located right against this quaint little fishing village, and it's famous for its beautiful silver-colored sand. In fact, the beach is so famous, lots of people come out here and just camp out on the beach because it's just so beautiful. There's also a very busy open-air seafood market right nearby, which is really cool because all the fishermen come in and literally offload their catch right onto the table, and they sell it to people coming by. And also, up in the mountains, you could see these beautiful bright green crops, which were tea plantations that made the air in Yelpo Beach kind of floral and sweet-smelling. But before Kim and Chu began exploring all the kind of main tourist attractions, they wanted to go check out the fishing pier, which was not really a touristy attraction, it was just a regular fishing pier. But, you know, Kim and Chu had been on this hour-long train ride, and they wanted to stretch their legs, and the sun was starting to go down, and so they figured they could walk out on the pier, have a beautiful view of the water, and watch the sunset, and then after that, they could go kind of explore the main areas. And so, Kim and Chu, still holding hands, began walking on the silver sandy beach in the direction of this fishing pier off in the distance, and as they were walking, Chu pulled out her camera and was taking all these pictures, but then at some point, Kim, who again is holding Chu's hand, he just abruptly stops and kind of squints his eyes and looks off in the distance towards the fishing pier. And Chu, she puts her camera down and asks Kim, you know, what's going on? But Chu, without even saying anything to her, just raises his hand and points. And then seconds later, Kim and Chu were running down the beach. The next day, Chu was supposed to call her mother and check in about how the trip was going so far, but she never did. And so her mother eventually tried calling Chu later in the day, but it went straight to voicemail. And then also, when Chu's mother called Kim, Kim was also not answering his phone. And so by the end of this day, when Kim and Chu's parents had not heard from their child, they did not wait for any more information. They knew this was so uncharacteristic of these two to go completely radio silent with no reason that the parents just went straight to the police and filed missing person reports. The police would launch an investigation very quickly, but they didn't have much to go on. All they knew was two adults were not answering their phone but that was it. And so they started by trying to locate Kim and Chu's phones, but neither phone was giving off a signal, so they couldn't find them. And so next, the police went to Yelpo Beach and began talking to people who were there on the day that Kim and Chu were to ask them if they had noticed anything funny, if they had seen the couple, you know, did you notice them fighting? Were they talking to anyone unusual? I mean, anything. But nobody remembered anything out of the ordinary. And the few people who had seen Kim and Chu on the day they were at Yelpo Beach, they said they seemed like a very happy, normal couple that were not fighting at all and were just enjoying their time in Yelpo Beach. And so over the course of that weekend, the police tried everything they could to try to locate Kim and Chu and figure out what happened, but they really made no progress whatsoever, and Kim and Chu never checked in by the end of that weekend. But everything would change on that Monday, September 3rd. On that day, a fisherman spotted a body floating in the water near Yelpo Beach, and it was Chu's body. And then two days after that, on September 5th, Kim's body washed up at a dock at a nearby fishing village. Both Kim and Chu were totally unrecognizable after being submerged in water for as long as they had been. Autopsies would show that Kim and Chu also had lots of bone fractures, but it wasn't clear if they were beaten by someone or something and that's what caused the fractures, or if they were just a product of being in the water for so long and smashing into rocks and boats and that kind of thing. But the police thought, you know, this looks like there could be foul play involved. You know, maybe they were murdered. And so the police went back and began scouring all the footage from all the cameras at Yelpo Beach to see if maybe they could find some clip that would show what happened to this couple. And eventually, one of the detectives who was looking through all this footage found something really interesting. He found a very short clip of the couple over at that fishing pier that they had been walking towards. However, they were not up 
on the fishing pier like you would expect. They were below the fishing pier on the sand. And they were kind of standing next to each other, holding each other close. And there was nobody else around them. It was like this totally weird thing. Now, as weird as this was, because it made no sense for them to be below the fishing pier, there didn't appear to be any hazards or other people or anything near them. It was like they just chose to be under there for some reason. But regardless, the police would actually use this video clip to close the case. The police would say that, you know, based on this clip, it appears that this was the final moment of the couple, you know, underneath this pier, and then something happened, either an accident, they might have fallen in the water or something and they drowned, or maybe, you know, this couple elected to take their lives together. And while Kim and Chu's families vehemently disagreed with the police assessment, there was nothing they could do. The case was now closed. Nobody was trying to figure out what happened to Kim and Chu. That is, until four weeks later, on September 26, 2007, when two more bodies, two young women, washed up on shore right around the same area where Kim and Chu had. The two young women had a lot of similarities to Kim and Chu. They were in their early 20s, they were tourists at Yelpo Beach, and their autopsies discovered that they had several bone fractures. And so this was enough for the police to launch a much bigger investigation into what was going on at Yelpo Beach, which included reopening the Kim and Chu case. And so a detective was assigned to go back through all the evidence in the Kim and Chu case and kind of re-examine it. And so this detective did look through all these pictures and he would find one picture that broke the case wide open. Back on the night that Kim and Chu were at Yelpo Beach and they began walking towards the fishing pier, Kim had abruptly stopped and raised his finger and pointed at something and then seconds later he and Chu were running in that direction. Well, what Kim had spotted was a fisherman who was standing below the fishing pier and he was very obviously making his way over to his fishing boat to go back out on the water. And Kim just felt like it would be really cool to go ask that fisherman if they could join him and go out on the water with him on his fishing boat to get a view of Yelpo Beach that way. And Chu, when she heard this idea, thought it was a great idea, and the two of them ran to the pier to try to catch this fisherman before he took off. And so that was why there was footage of the couple standing underneath the fishing pier. They were actually talking to this fisherman who could not be seen in frame. The fisherman was a 70-year-old man named Wu Jun Gwen, and he made his living selling octopus. And at first, when Kim and Chu approached Wu and asked to go with him on his boat, he said, no, I don't want you to come with me. But Kim and Chu seemed really desperate to go out with him, and finally he relented and said, okay, you can tag along. Wu was very thin and short, but he had been working on fishing boats since he was a child, and so despite his appearance of being this kind of small, frail guy, he was actually really physically strong. And despite Wu's kind of harmless-seeming exterior, inside, Wu was a very, very disturbed person. The reason Wu did not want to bring Kim and Chu with him out on this boat is he knew he would have an urge that he would not be able to control. But when they kept begging him over and over again to go with him, he finally just accepted that this was going to happen. He allowed them on his boat, he brought them out onto the water, and sure enough, he would act on those urges. Once Wu's boat was out on the water far away from the beach, he immediately pushed Kim overboard, and so Kim falls into the water, and then Wu grabbed this long metal grappling hook and began beating Kim in the water on his face, his arms, his hands, as Kim desperately tried to climb back in the boat. And eventually, Wu literally beat Kim to death. And at the same time, Chu is on this boat watching this happening. And so after her boyfriend has been beaten to death, Wu turns on Chu and does the same thing to her. He chucks her overboard and beats her until she dies from this grappling hook. And then afterward, Wu just got back behind the wheel, putted back to shore, and sold his octopus like nothing had happened. And Wu very likely would have gotten away with these first two murders, except four weeks later, it just so happened that two more tourists, those two young women, just happened to ask Wu the same question. Can we go out with you on your boat? And he would kill them the same way he killed Kim and Chu. Except one of those two young women, while they were out on the water in his boat before they were attacked, she 
she sensed something was wrong and she sent a text message saying she was in trouble on a boat. And when the police found these two women's bodies and found that text message, they immediately searched the registry that listed all the boats that had been out on the water near Yelpo Beach that day. And because it was a holiday, there was nobody out on the water except for one boat. And that boat was Wu's boat. And this is where that photo the detective found on Chu's camera roll when finally somebody looked through the photos, that's where that photo comes into play. The last picture that Chu took is of Wu. Wu is right in front of her, he's piloting the boat out into the open ocean, and Chu just took a picture of him, not knowing what was actually happening, that this guy was driving her out to her death. Ultimately, Wu would be convicted of the murders, even though he didn't really offer up any clear explanation as to why he killed these people. He just kind of acted on these urges, so to speak, and he would be sentenced to death, and he would become the oldest death row inmate in South Korea. of June 25th, 2007, a 28-year-old man named Mike Barnett woke up to the sound of pounding rain on the roof of his home, which was located in Hull, which is a city in northern England. Mike groaned as he rolled out of bed. It had been raining like this for the past month, and he and the rest of the people in Hull were just totally over it. But another reason he groaned is he knew that he would have to go to his job at a tropical fish store, even though he was not scheduled to work that day. There was a street right behind the tropical fish store that always completely flooded out from all these debris getting clogged in the drain, and the owner of the tropical fish store, so Mike's boss, who was an elderly guy, he would always go out and try to clear the debris himself, and Mike just knew, you know, he really needed help, and today he knew his boss would be out there, and so he just felt like it was his responsibility to go in and help him clear out the debris. So Mike got dressed, he had some breakfast, and then as quietly as he could, he slipped out the front door. Mike was careful not to make too much noise because he didn't want to wake his dad, who he lived with. Mike and his dad had always been very close, but after the death of Mike's mother, he and his father had become even closer, and so they actually really enjoyed living together. But Mike also knew that his dad was very protective of him and very likely would not like the idea of Mike going out in this horrible storm to go try to clear debris in a flooded out street. It just was too dangerous. And Mike just didn't want to deal with that right now. And so he was able to slip out without waking up his dad. Mike hopped in his car and he drove to the fish store. And as soon as he got there, he hopped out. He went around to the back side of the shop. And sure enough, the entire street out back was totally flooded. Clearly, debris had blocked the drainage system. Now, Mike's boss was not out there yet. Mike could see him inside the shop, kind of going about his morning. And so Mike, without even going inside, just began wading into the water to begin clearing debris. The drain that was clogged by all this debris was located just off to the side of the sidewalk. It was down in a culvert. And so Mike very carefully walked off that sidewalk into this very cold, muddy water, and he began moving in the direction of where he knew the drain was. And so as he's walking, you know, the water is down to his ankles, maybe up to his knees at some point, but he gets closer and closer to where he knows this drainage is down in this culvert. And suddenly, Mike begins feeling this unbelievable suction at his feet that begins began pulling him basically straight down. Mike tried to move, but his feet were anchored to the ground, and then before long, he began getting pulled forward towards this drain, and then down he went. And as he went all the way down to his neck in the water, he felt this unbelievable pain in his thigh. Mike didn't know it, but his leg had been sucked through the drainage gate that was all blocked up. There were still some holes in it, and so his leg had gone through one of those holes, and it had pulled him all the way up to the top of his thigh and brutally snapped his leg in the process. And so Mike is in blinding pain from his leg being shattered and run through this grate, and he's literally up to his neck in this frigid water, and the wind's blowing, and it's raining, and the water's going in his mouth, and so Mike begins to panic and he's trying to pull himself out he can't and then he begins screaming for help and at that moment the owner of the fish store who was still inside the store looked out the window and he saw mike flailing around and instinctively the owner could tell just from the panicked look on mike's face that whatever was happening to him was an emergency 
And so the owner just picked up the phone, called the police, and after telling them what was happening, the owner ran out to Mike. When the first police officers arrived on the scene, Mike was still in the water up to his neck and the shop owner was right next to him. And the police officers, you know, they assessed the situation in front of them and they thought, okay, you know, clearly this guy, Mike, is trapped in the water. This is serious, but we can pull him out. You know, that's the obvious solution here. And so the two officers walked up to Mike. They waded through the water and got on either side of him, kind of pushing the shop owner out of the way. And then the two officers grabbed Mike's shoulders you know, these are strong police officers, and they began pulling on Mike, and as soon as they did, Mike let out this unbelievably loud scream of just pure agony. And in fact, his scream was so guttural that the two officers let go and were kind of startled by it. And very quickly, these officers realized this situation is far worse than it appears, because not only is this guy totally stuck and he can't be moved, but, you know, they're looking around and the rain is still coming down, and it's clear here, the water is still slowly rising, and because Mike's body was situated over the grate, he himself was causing even more blockage, increasing how much the street was flooding, meaning the officers knew they had to get Mike out as soon as possible or he would drown. But over the next several hours, more police officers, firefighters, EMTs, Good Samaritans, I mean, everybody showed up on the scene, and there were so many attempts to get Mike out of the water, ranging from trying to cut the grate, but the water was too muddy so nobody could see through it, and the water was so strong that nobody could set the bolt cutters on the actual grate, and then at one point they even tied a winch around Mike and tried to pull him out with a Land Rover, but every intervention failed. Failed. The rushing water that was pinning Mike to this grate was so strong and Mike's pain in his leg was so high, it made it nearly impossible to move him. And so finally, at the four hour mark that Mike has been trapped in this water, a decision was made amongst all the first responders to amputate. So the police called a doctor who was willing to perform the leg amputation. And then after doing it, Mike could sense something was up. You know, clearly it's not going well. And he began frantically asking the police and all the first responders, when are you gonna get me out of here? When are you gonna get me out of here? And they just kept telling him, soon, soon, Mike, hold on, it's gonna be okay. Meanwhile, the owner of the shop at this point had called Mike's dad to tell him what was going on. And so as all these people are waiting for this doctor to show up to cut Mike's leg off, Mike's father shows up and basically barrels through the crowd and starts screaming, I'll get my son out of here. But as soon as he saw his son, he was totally taken aback. Mike was up to his chin in water. There was a diver behind him in the water with him, holding him up, barely keeping his head above the water. Mike's face was totally pale and his eyes were totally unfocused. And he had this weird blank expression like he wasn't even there. And then a second later, a whole wall of police came running up to Mike's dad to stop him from getting any closer. And they told Mike's father they were doing everything they could to try to get his son out. And for now, they told him he just needed to go home. And so even though Mike's dad did not want to abandon his son, he could tell with all these police standing there in front of him, there was no way he was going to be able to go up there with his son. And so he would turn around and head back home without even speaking to his son. And then when Mike's dad got home, he turned on the news and the news was showing live coverage of his son trapped in that grate. And just a couple of minutes later, Mike's dad would watch his son die on the news. By the time that doctor arrived with that special saw to cut off Mike's leg, it was already too late. Mike had passed away from hypothermia. On a July day in 1976, a man named Ray suddenly felt this unbelievable pain in his chest. And so Ray he grabbed his chest and grimaced, and then the pain subsided. Now, Ray had never experienced any sort of pain like that before, but he knew he was getting older, and so things like heart attacks and heart disease were definitely on his mind. But he told himself that he was okay. You know, a couple of days ago, he had gone to this big military veteran convention, and he had stayed up late and had lots of food and lots of drink. And so he was telling himself, that, you know, now he was paying for kind of letting loose. But after Ray lied down for a minute, thinking that might help him, he sat up suddenly because again, the chest pain
Kate was back. And so quickly, Ray was rushed to the hospital. And when he got there, he began coughing up all this pink froth. And the doctors had no idea why. This was not a heart attack. This was not heart disease. This was something else. And not long after Ray was admitted to this hospital, all across the state, more men began being admitted to emergency rooms with the same symptoms as Ray. And nobody knew what it was. And so doctors all across the state began to panic that this was the start of a deadly epidemic. To hear the full story, check out The Philly Killer, which is episode number 15 of the Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries podcast. And remember, you can actually binge episodes of Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries early on Amazon Music because we release them in eight episode batches. And so you get all eight on Amazon Music. Or if you're listening on any other platform, you'll get all the episodes, but you'll get them in one episode increments each week. Again, go check out Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries. So that's going to do it. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have literally hundreds of stories, a lot like these, that are available to listen to right now. Again, the podcast is just called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available on Amazon Music. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you like today's video about places you can't go, well, you're in luck because we have a whole series of them. Click here.